How is everyone doing tonight? Everyone getting their, yeah, that's good. Getting their coffee in, I see. All right. How was a uh, good, nice first round with Ira? Uh, next up, we have, of course, Wynn Schwarto. Going to give you your the most famous Meta Wars talk. Come on up, Wynn. Um, I'm going to do a little disclaimer. Wynn's a little lost his voice, so please be aware of them. Thank you. Good morning. Oh, damn. Is anybody out there? I can't see from the lights. Good morning. 30 some years ago, I did that, which allegedly gave me some credibility. But I'm working on something new that I want to discuss, and I want your feedback later. I got to, which slides am I using? Okay. Working on the concept of Meta War. And you, you may or may not have heard of it yet. It's something I began, oh, about uh, two years ago. And the original idea that I had was I was going to look at the metaverse, whatever that's going to be, and look at it from a technical standpoint, the privacy security lens that we normally use when we examine systems. But something happened along the way. I had a metanoia. Metanoia is a, an old Greek word for change of worldview, a complete mental catharsis that has redefined not only the meta war thesis, but the way that I view the world and humanity as technology, silicon systems, and humanity, carbon-based systems, we're trying to learn how to coexist. And it took this entire idea into a completely different direction. So what is meta war? Meta war is about reality distortion. It's about changing minds, it's about belief systems, and it's about trying to gain control of your perceptions of the world and how you interact with it. And this is an art and it's a science, but a lot of the science is something that we really don't look at in the traditional cybersecurity way of the universe. So what is the metaverse? Well. I think that there's some great applications for pieces of it, uh, teaching uh, doctors how to operate on virtual humans before they go playing with real humans, teaching kids how to drive in really hostile environments through immersion and before we allow them out on the road. So there's some really good stuff going on in it. But there's also an awful lot of promises and hyperbole over this Neil Stevenson view, Ready Player One view, is that the metaverse? And uh, it may be something like that along the line, but I really look at it differently. That the metaverse is the most powerful and addictive reality distortion technology ever created by man. And at this point, we seem to be okay with that. But is the metaverse really all about technology? And I've come to the conclusion, no, it's not. The metaverse is about storytelling. It's about getting a viewer, a participant, an experiencer to believe. So imagine Homer 2,500 years ago around a Greek campfire telling the stories about Odysseus and his travails, or Troy and Ajax through the Iliad. The object is to captivate the mind and momentarily become part of the story, become immersed in it in such a way that your reality has shifted. Now we've all had this happen to us. Let's say you're at home and you're watching a movie on the big screen immersive TV and you're just watching it and you sort of fall into it and you only become aware of it when you're pulled out, when you're reaching for the potato chips or a soda and you go, wow, I was really into that. 
and you have your chips, and then you fall back in. You're not aware of the reality shift until you are removed from it. And it's something that we all go through at one point or another when we're reading, watching a movie, experiencing any sort of external stimulus to our system. How does this work? Well, let's go to 1938. Orson Welles, Halloween Eve, told a story on the radio so that the folks from Harper's Mill or Grover's Mill, New Jersey, brought out their guns to shoot the aliens. They believed the immersive story that Orson Welles told just over one dimension, the dimension of hearing. And they believed it enough to actually take action. So we've been inventing more and more immersive technology. Then along comes TV, and then there's 3D TV, <laughs> sort of, kind of not, movies, immersive movies, movies, IMAX, in order to make us feel like we're flying an avatar. Now, when I watch a helicopter go over the edge of the Grand Canyon, I fall over literally fall over on the couch because some of my senses are somewhat distorted. But we also have the technology to be able to trigger that in almost anybody. And at the end of the metaverse is what I call the meta point, maybe other words for it, where our consensual objective reality is indistinguishable from an immersive experience. And that's what they're trying to sell us is gonna be happening. And if it is, the question really becomes, do we want that to happen? Because of the problems that are associated with it. So the meta war thesis is actually very, very simple. It begins with storytelling, any format, verbal, pictorial, a picture is worth a thousand words. Tell a story, but in order to do that, I need to immerse you in it, whether it's through a movie, through a book, or just through conversation. And that immersive experience requires that I use reality distortion. I want to fool you. I want to fool you into maybe enjoying that experience or becoming scared by that experience. Tower of Terror. We do this to ourselves because we seem to enjoy it. But in order to do reality distortion, I have to use some form of disinformation. When you're reading a novel, is there any truth in it? It is 100% disinformation. A sci-fi movie, 100% disinformation. Not meant to harm, but meant to create and enhance your experience and its believability. Now, once I've done that disinformation, I now can manipulate you. I can manipulate your mind because I've got you buying into whatever the immersive experience, storytelling environment may be. Now, how do I strengthen it? Do the same thing that we're doing to eight-year-old girls these days. We're turning them into digital opioid addicts because of reward systems on social media and other technology platforms. They need more and more and more of that natural chemical stimulation because every time they get a like, they get a dose of feel-good chemical. Then they want more and more and more. And once I've got that going, I've created addiction to whatever the technology may be. And if you'll note, does anybody know what the most popular book that VCs use as a reference guide before they invest in a company? Anybody know? The book, what? <laughs> the book is called Hooked. Came out in 2014, and it defines that any technology that is being invested in from Silicon Valley must be addictive. It has to be sticky. Otherwise, none of these other criteria will be met, and you're not going to make the billions of dollars. Once you've got addiction, then you have compliance, because I take away the, re the threat of taking away reward, 
And once I've got compliance, if I keep doing it, I've turned you into a believer. And this is the sequence of the Metal War thesis that I thought was a technical exercise and really what isn't. I know the words are small, but what this basically is doing is pre-storytelling, early, early technology, the technologies that we have today that we're using to create reality distortion fields in order to make us believe and enjoy the immersive experience. And as we aim towards the meta point, there's all these new technologies that we're messing around with right now, all of which are designed to change your view of reality. So this afternoon, I hope uh, you come to the talk on do we live in a simulated universe because this becomes very core to the concept of reality distortion in the metaverse, any iteration of it whatsoever, and the application of the art and science of meta war. So our default reality arbitrarily is there. Do we have a deeper base reality? We're gonna talk about that this afternoon on the panel. But what we are creating is simulated realities. What's the difference? There really is none. It's a hierarchical structure of what's real and what's not real. Now, some really interesting and disturbing things come out of this. Our entire experience, our perception, our reality, our belief systems are created by external senses impinging on us and our memories, our emotional memories, our belief systems, all of those that have become ingrained in our primal response systems, because we are fundamentally primal beings and our systems are designed for survival. Everything else is extraneous and this is where they will be taking advantage of our weaknesses, our mental weaknesses, to be able to convert entire populations. Now something else really came out to me. In the brain we have two. We have our unconscious brain and the unconscious brain, stuff we don't know what we're doing, it's just automatic, including our primal response systems. And we process 400 billion bits of information every second, 400 billion. But what about our conscious mind, the one that we think we're aware of? That only processes about two kilobits of information per second made me ask myself, who's in charge of my brain? And this started taking me down to some really odd places because when we look at cognitive perception, we look at it from the primal standpoint and this is called the four Fs. The four Fs, we have our primal system, the fl flight or fight reaction. So the first F is fleeing, second one is fighting. Our third primal one in the four Fs is feeding. And then the fourth of the four Fs is mating. Yeah, anytime, okay, that's Thank you. <laughs> but that is how external control of our systems, what that targets, it targets these through the external senses. And how powerful can it be? If you've never read any of the work of Yuri Bezmenov, it is explicit as to how the Soviet Union and Russians viewed information warfare, unlike the way we did. And in my book, I looked at it technically. They view it as a psychological kind of warfare exclusively. And, well, they may be having some success, especially in this country, I know Finland is involved, Estonia, they're uh, very, very bothered by this because the issue of belief system has certainly splintered a great deal of what's going on in this country because of absolutism. Absolute 100% belief in anything, doesn't matter, was it political, is it religious, is it that chair is real, is it a, some cyber stuff, is it real or not real? 
And unfortunately, I do not believe in zeros and ones, for those of you who have read my books on time and analog security. Everything is in the middle. It's probabilistic. It's unknowable specifically because we don't have the granularity. We don't have the technology to do these kind of measurements. So all of the goals of the Meta Warrior is to influence your senses, to influence the primal system such that you either believe things that are not true or refuse to believe things that are true. And this is the difference as we're gonna see between our two realities, our objective one that we can agree on. This is a podium, this is a microphone, that's a screen, something. What about subjective reality? Our entire reality is based upon how we perceive the external world and how that perception is merged with our history, our emotional, largely less so intellectual history, how our primal system has been taught from the age from being born. So now we take this and we say, how am I gonna, how am I gonna mess with it? But some other th numbers, when I started examining them, came out and really started to bother me. So these are the fundamental senses that goes on inside the brain, what have you. But when we look at the numbers, 85% of our perception of reality is done through our eyes. But that's only 10 megabits a second. How can we see all of this retinal quality reality that comes in roughly at 12K? How can that happen in only 10 megabits a second? All right. Everybody now, stare at me. I know you're enjoying this, right? And stare at me, and you see me right here, but you're also aware of here and there and up and down. You're aware of it, but you're focusing on me. Now, this is an interesting phenomenon because the eye only resolves 2% of the visual field. The rest of what you think you see is a memory from about 200 milliseconds ago. And the brain glues it back together using various types of clock systems because the brain is really nothing more than a time machine. Synchronizing all of the external stimuli, internal nervous system, and how it reacts. 10 megabits a second, the ears 100K and then correspondingly slower. So we take those five senses that we know about, and then there's the vestibular sense, it keeps us vertical, keeps us from tipping over our sense of balance. And oddly enough, that operates completely unconsciously, part of that 400 billion bits per second, and operates roughly in a feedback loop of eight milliseconds entirely too fast for conscious awareness, which takes, depending upon the stimuli, between 30 and 300 milliseconds. So we're effectively blind to most of what we're experiencing, and we have to accept the fact there is no such thing as now. Does not exist in the human condition. Everything we see, everything we do is delayed by Roughly, use the number 250 milliseconds, close enough for discussion points. We exist only in the past. Then we have interoception, which is when you feel hungry, that's an internal sense. When you feel itchy, when you feel things, those are internal senses. Our bio system, our, what they call them the bio meme, I believe now. That's all internal sensing. And then we have proprioception. Proprioception is how do I relate to this podium? Am I aware situationally of what's around me? So these are the senses that really give us what we believe as stimulus in order to, what the Meta Warriors will be doing, influence us as per the Meta War thesis. Now part of the reality distortion is pretty straight ahead. All right, there's a building. 
Is that the same building or a different one? Same or different? This is our modern version of Plato's cave. Plato's cave is an existence of people that are tied to the wall of a cave. Everything they see is on the wall in front of them, which is a two-dimensional flat reconstruction of the 3D world on the outside. Is that accurate? Is it true? Is it believable? Or is it airsoft, or do you have to step away from two dimensions into three dimensions in order to be able to capture any sense of what's real? Three dimensions, four dimensions, same argument. And we don't have these answers yet. We don't know the answers. But we do know that we can fool the mind very easily using these types of techniques. So, got all these senses impinging on us. But that is what I call passive, that's passive meta war, where just throwing information at the human through the five senses, and that will trigger the other senses. But we need more to make things real. When you're sitting at that racing car gaming system at home, you want to feel like you're on the race course. You want haptic feedback. So what we need to do is have various types of mechanisms to do tracking, biosensors, physical tracking, haptic feedback loop, in order to give us more of an immersive, believable experience. We have the technology, and the numbers, again, are staggering. Face tracking, roughly, with today's tech, 30,000 points every second. That's pretty granular. We, could, we will get more, but pretty granular there. Muscle ticks, reactions in the iris, all of those are part of our unconscious response system that does not come to the front of our minds. This is all automatic and what meta warriors are going to be using against us. Now, we're going to end up with body suits. Now, imagine all of this feedback technology, the biosensing, and a bodysuit with one million sensors per square centimeter. What is the ideal application for all of that stuff? Shout it out. Meta porn, dude. Meta porn. This is going to be an industry. Everybody knows the internet was created for porn. And this is where. If you haven't looked this stuff up, there's some really interesting tech going on. And it's all about creating a believable experience. We have kissing machines now developed out of the universe, uh, sorry, Carnegie Mellon. And they're working on more and more enhanced physical responses that you wouldn't think are going to be easy to do. But they're developing the technology to do that. Other thing that they can do is start, we're starting to read minds. So on the left is the image that is shown to a test subject. That's the EEG of what the brain is projecting and sending out. This is only six months old. Is it going to get better? Yeah. How much better? We don't know yet. But I think that we're going to keep trying to make it more and more and more realistic. So I ended up with all of these numbers looking at, this is how our carbon system works, totally independent of any other silicon systems, yet what are we trying to do? We're trying to merge them. We're trying to coexist with them, and we have been, well, since the 50s when computers started becoming part of enterprise and government, and then finally in the home. And we are doing maybe a good job, maybe a bad job, but it all comes down to orchestration. Orchestration of what is being impinged on you for your senses, and then all of the tracking and the haptics and the feedback loops, and what do those do? Those respond unconsciously, you are responding unconsciously to go back and tell through the feedback loops 
The content orchestrator, ooh, Bob reacted really negatively to the color blue. Maybe we should give him the color red. Or may maybe that haptic response was a little too violent or maybe not violent enough and he, we need to kick up a little more adrenaline in his system. Now how are we measuring all of this stuff is going to be very interesting as new tech comes out and we discover that we're blind. Here's the timing aspects of the blindness. We are blind 40 minutes a day. Absolutely zero vision 40 minutes a day. Now how do I mess with that? By taking advantage of the known delays, the known response times, detection times, trigger times, all the languages that we speak apply to the carbon sensory systems and how they create our reality. And that's part of that reality distortion. It turns out that I work on the Starship Enterprise. Then we're going to add in AI. Every, everybody's going to want to automate all this stuff with AI. Now here's the problem. Humanity created AI in our image. We don't like what we see. We are hoping to control AI and put it on guardrails, but it's a model of us. How well are we doing on controlling our own guardrails and behavior? Now we want to do it with AI and merge the systems together, the carbon systems and the silicon systems. Merge them together. Is that necessarily a good idea right now? And then obviously we have the pendulum of whether it's algorithmic bias, data bias, large mo language model bias, we don't know how this stuff works yet. Yet, we're gonna go out and proliferate it across the planet. And on, that's all about all I ever talk about AI, because we don't know. And all the scare stuff, I think Kate talked about that yesterday. So all of this thus far adds up, and here's a word we all know, attack surface. The new attack surface that has been being used through Russians, Machiavelli, Hitler, some politicians maybe today, that is the new attack surface that we as cybersecurity people are going to have to deal with as we merge carbon and silicon systems together. And there's a ton of math, there's a ton of science, some of which exists now, but an awful lot of which is not ready for prime time. Now, before you think some of this is BS, has anybody read the July patent from Apple? Anybody? All right, I did. Day it came out. In the earpieces, 38 biosensors, blood pressure, GSR, EK, EC, EK, um, EEG, all of the biosensors are built into the earbuds to do what? Tell whatever the application is that's creating the experience how you are responding to it so it could be dynamically altered to make it for the good guys more pleasing, for the bad guys more addictive, and turning your belief systems into something else. How are we going to defend against all this stuff? And that really bothered me, and I spent a huge amount of time traveling and uh, going to universities and meeting with scientists to figure out where, where is this? How can we do anything proactive to defend against things that we are currently experiencing? How do we defend against eight-year-old girls becoming addicted to digital opioids? We're doing it now, but how do we defend against it? So there's three fundamental areas, technology, policy, and then the cognitive issues, because we have not ever really addressed cognitive issues other than don't click on stupid shit for phishing campaigns. That's really what we've done, because we've convinced or trying to convince users that users are the enemy. And that is, yeah, they are part of the problem, but it is not the enemy, and that's an abdication of responsibility by much of our field. So as I got into this, it's like 
I realize PII, we're spending huge amount of time and effort, and Ira was talking about it, trying to defend something that may or may not be worth defending. But PII is going to disappear. It will become absolutely meaningless, and it will be replaced with technologies like that Apple one, with personally identifiable behavior where the technology at the back end will know exactly how you will respond to any given set of sensory stimuli. And that's scary. Personally identifiable behavior, we're having enough trouble now just trying to figure out how to protect PII, whether it's in motion or at rest. Now it's our behavior. PII does not give the technology or the bad guys the ability to predict personally identifiable behavior because it's dynamic, does give the ability to it to do that. And we have a new architecture that's being evolved out of this. And we've got the body area network, for lack of any other word right now, our endpoint, and then various levels of different types of servers, edge servers, mini cloud servers, big cloud servers, and it's all about the new equations that are going to replace DOS and DDoS. When we're having an immersive experience, we don't want to have a glitch in the universe or in the matrix. We want to maintain it. We hear us music and we hear a skip, and it's jarring. It alters our immersive experience and the goodness of it. Visually, when something happens on the TV and the video does something screwy, that's not because of DOS or DDoS, it's because of where we're headed that the disruption to the reality distortion fields is purely a function of latency. The latency of the systems and how they correspond to the internal latencies of our biosystems. And we're trying to merge these things together. This are some of the specs of what's going to be required as we move forward. And we're going to be looking at two to 10 gigabits a second synchronously from the human being in order to create decent, immersive, multi dimensional sensory inputs. And that is a lot. So we have all of this new technology coming out, and what's going to be the result of it? Well, we're going to begin with enhanced capital, uh, surveillance capitalism. I now know how you're going to behave. What does that do for an advertiser? What does that do for a marketer? When you go to Walmart, I, I, my wife and I um, noticed that it was six or seven years ago, you go to Walmart, and she likes peanut butter. So there were eight brands of peanut butter. Now, at Walmart, there's three. What they discovered, and finally implemented at Walmart, when you have eight choices, people can't decide. When you have three choices, ah, that's a hell of a lot easier because the brain, and part of our primal system, is always looking for easy answers, not the hard ones. We fall to the easy. And when you have eight choices, the easy one often is, I don't need it that bad, I'm gonna move on because the brain subconsciously cannot talk to the conscious mind and help it make a decision that is easy and within a reasonable period of time. So surveillance capitalism, once we've got this amount of data and personally identifiable behavior, well, we should be able to control that, shouldn't we? Except when you read, and I don't know if any of you have read, Facebook's Meta Quest VR manual and the policy statement says they're going to share all that personally identifiable behavior information with third parties with no controls, no rules, and they're just going to either give it away or sell it. Do we want that? Well, we're already allowing it, and it's only going to get a lot worse. When you want to influence people, you want to influence them emotionally. And that's talking to the subconscious, that's talking to the primal portion of our brain. 
the amygdala, is the lizard brain very loosely. And that is where we make our knee-jerk reactions, snap judgments, our gut reactions are based upon the accumulation of years and years of priming our system, priming our primal system with experience, with learning. When we speak a language, it's not done consciously. It's all enhanced learning that affects who we are, what we are emotionally, and it's all unconscious. Should we be concerned at the policy level about how much reality distortion is legal? Should we be able to create games, Roblox, let's take Roblox and put it on steroids and aim it at 10-year-olds? Is that a good thing? Should we do it? And if not, how do we put guardrails on it? Or do we look at it as reality distortion? Or do we look at it as addiction? Either way, the answer is very uh, uncomfortable as to how we're going to make all of this work. Because we are building more and more addictive. How many, t uh, anybody know how many times the average American you, looks at his phone? Anybody? 17? Add a couple zeros. It sits around 200 times a day, depending upon the curve and all that. But a, that is a boatload. But when you're an eight-year-old girl or and you're at school or you're a teenager going through angst, how many times did you look at it? You look at it because you want likes. That's the addictive feedback loop. We've all seen it. Some of your kids, may, grandkids, may already you see it in them or you see it in adults who cannot get off their phone or any device because they're constantly, constantly looking for that digital opioid fix. And that's what drives us. And if Steve Jobs was here, he'd probably admit he designed one of the most addictive technologies ever. Well, policy can only do so much, and I don't think that we're in really great shape with that. We've got AI and humanity with the same set of problems because, well, they're fundamentally designed along the same architectural methodology. Well, so we can't do a whole lot of tech, can't do a whole lot of effective policy because we'll never get the country to agree, we'll never get the world to agree on what is the right balance. So we got to look at something else that has really not been explored. It's called the cognitive immune system. How can we protect our brains from the effects of all of this? And this brought me down some incredible rabbit holes, uh, and I've been enjoying the hell out of it. Please don't take this stuff as an absolute answer. It is an attempt to try to get interdisciplinarians to talk to each other and look at different fields, primarily experimental psychology, neuroscience, and cybersecurity. Because we're used to the concepts of silicon defense systems and some sort of inoculation. Now, in our world, we surround our systems with protection. We put a firewall, we put access control, we've got filters, and we have rule sets that surround the jewels, surround the systems. We don't have self-healing systems yet, despite the fact that it's how many years we've been building operating systems and we don't have one that can fix itself yet. I mean, that's what we've created. So we're surrounding our tech with stuff. Is that real inoculation? Nah, that's perimeter style controls. We've been doing that for 35, 40 years. But the concept comes into the pathologies of our body. So traditional style of virus is inject a weakened form of the virus. I'm just going to use the word virus loosely. Let's not get into the semantics. Weakened form, you might get a little sick, and then you have built up immunity against it because it triggers the antibodies to recognize the same pathogen if you're exposed to it again. Pretty straight ahead. And then along comes COVID. 
and we didn't know what we were going to do, but they had been working on the concept of mRNA. And that means that instead of injecting the actual virus itself or a weakened form of it, you're in injecting instructions, rules by which the biological immune system will build its own antibodies without any viral infection. And there was a lot of discussion about that back to what do you believe? Do you believe the government? Do you believe Fauci? Do you believe that China or, or any of the belief systems surrounding COVID? Regardless, the mRNA, certainly in my opinion, is a remarkable technology that's going to have huge applications way beyond COVID. But when we look at the known unknown matrix, things get a little bit better when we do that because we have some knowns, we have some unknowns, and we have known unknowns and unknown unknowns. So that matrix, we're all familiar with that with our world. But now what am I going to do for the cognitive immune system, assuming we have one? So the cognitive immune system, when you argue with other human beings, and I'm not even going to bring AI into this one, and they have a separate belief system, and that's back to that binary way of looking at the world. It either is or it isn't. No gray shades in the middle, which is certainly not critical thinking. But facts don't matter. Evidence doesn't matter. No matter what you can possibly think of to say, you will never convince or dissuade somebody from a hard-coded primal belief system. Similarly, you can't use emotion against it. The emotional and fact-based type of attacks or inoculation mirror traditional viral types of inoculation. And they don't work in the mind. They don't work in the mental system. However, what if we could inoculate the cognitive immune system to recognize and relearn how to respond to external stimuluses and automatically, through the primal system, automatically build in cognitive thinking, put in proper responses. Can we do this? Well, I didn't know and I kept looking and researching and I found that there's a lot of different types of inoculations, lots of different types of approaches. Uh, one of the big ones is called debunking. Does debunking work? No. Debunking only works when somebody else is able to think outside, inside of the zero and one. If you're locked into the zero and one, no hope in hell. How to crack through that. So. Debunking is not going to work. Some people say pre-bunking. There's various types of studies that have been done, which all have some interesting results, which I'll cover. What we want the brain to do and the cognitive, mental cognitive uh, immune system, we want it to repair itself. We want it to fix itself. We want to get rid of the zeros and the ones and allow people to think versus just be this hominid that reacts in a survival mechanism that was given in our body when we needed to survive in the jungle. It's a different kind of jungle now, and we have to adapt to be able to coexist with the infrastructure, the cognitive, global cognitive infrastructure that we're building, and we haven't done a very good job with it. So the concept is, can we play a game? The original idea for mental inoculation came from a doctor I'd never heard of in 1961. And he had a proposed a theory that inoculating the mind and building up the cognitive immune system was something that could actually be done. That paper went unnoticed until 2014. And a professor out of Holland, van der Linden, got very interested in cognitive immune protection. Fast forward through all their research, and the first release of a way to tune 
and teach the cognitive immune system how to defend itself against external information pathologies, we'll call it that. They said, what happens if we play a game? And this first game came out, unfortunately, in December of 2019. Kind of bad timing. And it was called Bad News. And it's a game where you play against the computer right now, and you are fed some disinformation, except you don't know if it's disinformation or not, and you have to evaluate it, consciously make a decision. Then you are given the correct information, and we're not talking politics, religion, or anything. We're talking um, bananas are blue, right? Are you nodding that they're blue, sir? Work with me here, would you? <laughs> so they do that because they don't want to get into the subject matter, because that's an entirely different discussion. But the goal is, can the brain be taught to pause? So I, got, I noticed it this morning. I got on the elevator at the hotel and I'm looking at all the buttons, and I realize it's taking me four or five seconds to choose which floor to go to, and I'm going to the lobby. And then I realized it was because I've just spent a lot of time in Europe, and zero, one, two, they mean different things depending upon what part of the planet you're on. So I actually went through the process. Okay, I'm gonna, this is America, one is rez de chaussee, that's zero in Europe. So I paused. Can we interject a mechanism by which the brain will pause? And the answer, it turns out, is yes. And a series of these games have been developed. It's a very small ecosystem right now, largely in academia, and has not come out very far, using similar techniques. All right, so here's a, is it true or not? Mo Mozart outsold Beyonce. That's an innocuous thing. It's not political, not religious, but it makes you think. And I certainly don't know the answer. Does anybody know the answer? No? I don't know, I don't like Beyonce's music, so I, I, I'll kind of go with Mozart. And what you're doing in this game is, again, teaching the process of critical thought, but you're not teaching it to the conscious mind. You're teaching it to the unconscious mind to get it to rewire. Don't get hooked up, uh, hung up on that term specifically, but to rewire and get the primal response system of the amygdala to go, wait a sec. Hmm. Now, we are all really pretty, probably pretty good thinkers, critical thinkers, and we see the headline on a, any article, or we, we sit with one of our compatriots, like Rich Greenberg, and some bullshit comes out of his mouth. And no, and then we think, wait a minute, is he trolling me? Is that for real or not? We kind of tend to do this because cybersecurity people have very unique skills, which is why trying to get these three disciplines to talk to each other, I have so much hope for. Can we get that pause button to work? So more of this kind of just crap. And it turns out they have identified six fundamental ways to train the brain. And it's called depict. So uh, discrediting, ad hominem attack. Somebody says, uh, makes a statement or asks a question and the response is a personal attack against you not a rational response. That doesn't help anything. And we see congressional hearings, and that's going on all the damn time. They're not talking to each other. They're all doing ad hominem attacks to discredit. Trolling, is it a trolling exercise? Do people know how to recognize a trolling, uh, trolling mechanism? Well, that's part of all of this. Impersonation, some expert, if I get hired, to say that these are, this is the greatest cleaner for your kitchen ever known, and I'm a cybersecurity expert, so I know this, that's bullshit. But because I'm an expert over here, therefore I must know all about cleaners for the kitchen. 
We use these techniques in order to convince people of the legitimacy of particular positions, and they're all fallacious. And they all have to be taught to get that pause button in our brain to go, just wait a second. Is that real? Is that not real? It's like when you look out the window of an airplane and you see three silver discs flying right next to the wing of the airplane. Is that real? Or is that too many vodkas? Do you know? Did you bother to ask? And that's one of the things with a polarized society and a polarized planet, because belief systems have been used to control people for thousands of years. Now we gotta get some of that control back to the individual. For advanced training, we teach people how to think. And again, this is all done through gamification, through the amygdala, through the unconscious brain to prime our primal response systems to get away from those knee-jerk reactions and actually try to come up with rational responses. And these games exist, and uh, the thing that I found really interesting from the work from Vanderlinden, because he is still the leader in it, and we've had a lot of conversations in the last couple months, after playing one round of one of these training exercises, which takes five minutes, seven minutes, they found with post-testing a 52% increase in the ability to detect bullshit. 52% after one five to seven minute disinformation game. Now, obviously, like in cybersecurity, well, nothing lasts forever, and we're going to have, uh, if you're familiar with analog network security models, you're going to have a time degradation curve of efficacy that's going to decrease. So you've got to, like we do, get a flu shot every year. I've gotten a lot of COVID shots. It's those boosters. They have not gotten into the studies. I've talked to Professor Linden about this. Have you looked at the time decay and the efficacy of re-inoculation? And have you come up with a method yet to be able to measure the strength of the inoculation so we can start really putting some numbers around it? So it's super exciting. And I'm no experimentalist, but these guys are open to the conversation, which I find to be exceedingly exciting. One of the things that we also have in our world that I would love to start seeing adapted in this world is the concept of cyber ranges. Instead of playing against a computer, let's do it for real. Let's put all of those metathesis steps, including rewards and manip, all of those into a cyber range. We know how to do blue red teaming. We know how to do all of this. Now, wouldn't it be incredibly cool if we could do this for large groups of people in the wild. So we're looking at a number of ways to be able to actually get this done over time. Now what I've discovered, and my friend Mike Masucci and a couple of others that know who have been following me down this mental quagmire for the last two years, we end up, because of the math, because of the reactions, we end up with what David Chalmers, a brilliant philosopher out of NYU calls the hard problem consciousness? Do we have free will? Is it worth all this effort at all? It's called the hard problem. And I bumped up against it and I don't have answers because we're looking at so many different points of analysis, so many different detection points, reaction points, time components, feedback loops, and degradation of efficacy. We just don't have the science yet, but we do have the path that I really believe that we're going to have hopefully some success on because we've got the human system over here operating in a noodle loop, roughly 250 to 500 millisecond looping. We experience the world at 77 frames per second. That creates retinal quality for us at roughly 12K, but when we're whether this is AI or any soar based system at all in order to guide the orchestration, that's operating at under a millisecond. 
And when we apply John Boyd's OODA loop theories to it, what does that mean? It means silicon will win every time. And that is why we have to get that pause button built in to slow down the silicon response systems. And we're not quite there yet. But that is certainly the goal of what many of us are trying to do now. We're building the future. This time, maybe we can get it right, because I don't think we're going to get a, another chance. We're building a metaverse, no matter whose view of it you may or may not agree with, but we're building it. But we're not going to get another chance if we screw this one up, because once we merge carbon and silicon-based systems with no guardrails, no controls at all, then there is no return. The Swedish government has been the first to build up a psychological defense agency for their entire country. Do we have the political will in this country to do it? Hell no. That's why I'm doing so much of my work overseas right now, because of the openness of the cultures over there, and they're recognizing that humans actually come first. And that's a novel concept, but it's really been very rewarding for me. If you're interested in a lot of the background on this technology and the thinking that went into it, please buy hundreds and hundreds of books. I got a grandson, I got a feeds. And then MetaWar will be shipping on December 4. You can pre-order Kindle now, uh, the uh, paperback version. I'm having integration problems between Amazon and and spark but yeah i'll get it done but the book is coming out and it's really about how can we coexist with that which we have created in our own image and we don't like it at all thank you very much i appreciate it